Unfortunately, Dennis Gates and Missouri have missed out on a big-time transfer target. Plus, my talk with Alex Dono of Locked On Canes about Jake Garcia. Some really great information, so look forward to that and more right now on Locked On Mizzou. You are Locked On Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you true sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso and the central scrutinizer of Missouri Tigers football and basketball. Thanks, as always, for making Locked on Mizzou your first listen. And thanks for going to FanDuel because this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more by going to FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. And unfortunately, I got to get started today with some bad news on the basketball court. Caden Shedrick, the former University of Virginia player, transfer portal guy, if you will, well, he committed to Texas. A lot of the feelers going around on the Mizzou beat were that, well, Missouri was the leader in the clubhouse, but according to Caden Shedrick, he went with his gut and said, quote, Texas has had a significant history with bigs getting them to the next level. I just thought it was a better opportunity for me as an athletic big to go there. Well, hey, Caden Shedrick, it's your life, buddy. Go wherever you want. I'm just not sure I totally am following the logic there because I'm not sure what, I don't know, LaMarcus Aldridge and Rick Barnes, their relationship from 15 years ago has a lot to do with today. Obviously, Texas just hired their interim coach, Chris Beard, dismissed with his domestic violence situation, alleged, whatever it was. I, I'm not, I didn't follow that story real closely. I'm not going to lie to you, folks. I just know that he got fired. They have a new coach, so really Texas doesn't have much of a history of anything with athletic bigs. But honestly, if I'm an athletic big man, a truly a, a tall player who has skills, I don't think there's any system I would rather play in than what Dennis Gates and Missouri showed last year. How'd Kobe Brown look in that system? How did Noah Carter look in that system? Especially Kobe Brown, by the way. Kobe Brown, if anything, I don't think most people thought that from his junior season to his senior season, he could up his NBA draft stock as much as he did. And by the way, and by people, I should just say me, I wouldn't have believed that Kobe Brown could have shot it as well as he did last season in particular. And because of that, well, you might have seen Cable, or excuse me, Kobe Brown officially entered his name into the NBA draft. But as he said in his announcement, he's going to retain his eligibility for his final season. So this is all just kind of, this is expected news, really. Some of you may have initially thought, oh no, Kobe's gone. That's not necessarily the case. I still think there's obviously a really good chance that Kobe does stick it out and keep his name in the draft. As I've said many times, if you're an everydayer, I think obviously people, the NBA guys are going to like Kobe Brown as a human being. I think they know what to expect in terms of his leaping ability at the at the combine, that kind of stuff. But the actual interview process, I think that's what's really, really going to help a Kobe's stock, in my opinion. It's certainly not going to hurt it any, that's for darn sure. And well, if you were wondering if maybe there's an indication that Kobe's leaning that way too, to actually staying in the draft, I think maybe his brother Caleb Brown entering the transfer portal may be an indication there. Now, I think obviously the last couple years, certainly last season with the Dennis Gates transition from Conzo Martin to the Dennis Gates era, I think a lot of people maybe correctly assume that Caleb and Kobe were tied together. So if Caleb is leaving, well, kind of leads you to believe that maybe Kobe's leaning toward leaving as well. Either way, obviously, as I said before, Kobe keeping his options open. Now, when it comes to former Florida State Seminole Matthew Cleveland, another guy Missouri basketball is after, he had a really close relationship 
with C.Y. Young, who's, of course, Dennis Gates' lead assistant. So a lot of people have been assuming that Missouri's going to be in on that kid hard. Well, it appears their assumptions were correct. Apparently, it's down to Auburn, Missouri, and Miami, Florida for that young man. So, obviously, Matthew Cleveland, I talked about him a little bit a little bit last week if you're an everydayer, and yeah, I think he's obviously looks like an excellent player on paper, and he's also a guy that, while certainly not, I wouldn't compare him to Kobe Brown by any stretch of the imagination, but Cleveland is a guy who's tall enough to play the four, in my opinion, the de facto four spot. One of those forward spots, anyway, I think he could do that. He isn't that much smaller than Noah Carter, for instance. So I think that's a possibility there. Still, after missing out on Caden Shedrick, it would be nice, certainly, if Missouri could get a little bit more rebounding, rim protection perhaps. But as Dennis Gates has, has shown and told us explicitly, he's not just going to take size just to take size because, well, at this point, not there's – Already a ton of guys potentially on this roster, especially if Kobe Brown comes back, especially if Isaiah Mosley comes back next season. The roster's already getting pretty full, regardless of how many how many people you can actually have on your roster or not. That's another thing we've talked about a lot here lately. Well, regardless, at a certain point, you can only play five guys. So even if there is no actual roster limit, there is sort of a natural roster limit in that guys are going to go, wait a second, I want to be the 18th man on this team? I don't think so. And by the way, speaking of Matthew Cleveland, one correction, I was kind of poking fun at the season Florida State had this past year. Well, listener Jamie with a helpful correction he said John you forgot about Miami when listing better teams in Florida than Florida State this past year granted you may have also missed Tallahassee Community College so thank you Jamie for getting another shot in at the Seminoles I frankly enjoyed that but you know what speaking of the University of Miami we've Brought him up a couple times already in this first segment. Well, I want to talk more about former University of Miami Hurricane Jake Garcia, who may well be the Missouri starting quarterback this coming fall. So let's hear more about Jake Garcia from somebody who knows him much better than I do. A big-time Canes fan, in fact, the host of Locked on Canes. It's Alex Dono, and we had a great conversation about Jake Garcia, and I want to share that with you coming up. But first, I want to tell you that this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Yes, grand slams, no hitters, and double plays are back, and there's no better place to get in on the MLB action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers can step up to the plate with a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up place your first bet and get up to one thousand dollars back in bonus bets if you don't win and i gotta say i cannot believe i looked at the standings today the kansas city royals are one and twelve at kaufman stadium so far this year so you know what that means hey they're on the road at arizona today maybe they have a chance at plus 120 i wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot clown pole but hey you do you. But regardless, don't miss your chance at a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to fanduel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Locked On's NFL Mock Draft Special is here and it's bigger than ever. Follow along all 32 teams' first pick in a six episode ultimate mock draft experience only locked on can deliver all episodes are available now on locked on nfl draft on youtube or wherever you listen to podcasts and speaking of podcasts well alex dono hosts an, an excellent university of miami podcast and i thought who better to talk to than one of my own colleagues here at locked on about jake garcia again potentially missouri starting quarterback this fall had a great conversation and I want to share it right now. Well, hey, Alex, thanks for joining me, man. Uh, first of all, I just know, obviously, you're a, a gigantic Miami Hurricanes fan. So I'm just curious, this past offseason, when you heard that Jake Garcia 
was going to enter the transfer portal and leave the Canes. What was your first reaction? Uh, not surprised, but a, a little sad, honestly, John, because when Jake arrived a couple of years ago, class of 2021, I believe, it was a big recruiting score uh, for Miami. You know, he had had to move around the country to deal with the COVID year because he was a Southern California kid whose high school football was shut down. He moved over to Georgia had a great senior season, and he picked Miami over the likes of USC and others as a four-star quarterback. And, John, what was a little bit frustrating about you – know, frustrating from my point of view and from the Hurricanes fan point of view about Garcia was when he was a true freshman in 2021 – um, he was really trending positively. Uh, you know, that was a year when Miami starter at the time, De'Eric King, was playing through an injury. That injury got worse. And then that opened up an opportunity for a young quarterback to step in. And honestly, that year, I think Jake might have been the guy to get that opportunity as a true freshman, if not for the fact that he suffered a season ending injury, it was foot, ankle, something like that. So, that cleared the runway for Tyler Van Dyke, who then went on to have a fantastic 2021 season. But at that time, um, in the little glimpses we saw of Jake Garcia and Tyler Van Dyke with Van Dyke as a redshirt freshman, Garcia as a true freshman that year, uh, Garcia seemed to be a little bit ahead of Van Dyke at that time and may have been the guy who got the call that year, if not for that injury. Uh, but as a result of that, Van Dyke was the guy who made the most of that opportunity, really improved throughout the season that year. Uh, and, you know, I, I could do a whole nother conversation about Van Dyke because unfortunately his progress was hurt by the change in offensive coordinators last year and just a whole mess uh, with Miami's offense. Right. But, you know, you kind of wonder what might have been like if Garcia hadn't suffered that injury in 2021, he might even be the Hurricanes starting quarterback right now. Interesting. Well, I want to get to the 2022 season. You mentioned, obviously, not a great season for the Canes last year, to say the least. But back to 2021, just a little bit, what was it about Garcia that had you so impressed and encouraged for his future at that time? Uh, a lot of poise for an 18-year-old at that time. Uh, someone who already seemed to have, uh, just to have good vision, seeing the field, going through his projections quickly, very accurate with the short and intermediate stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if this part of his game is still evolving, but, you know, I, I, I don't consider Jake to be the best deep ball thrower. Uh, obviously, uh, quarterbacks can have tremendous careers, even if that's not a huge strength of theirs, right. uh, because even going back to kind of the comparisons between Garcia and Van Dyke. You know, Van Dyke was more successful and accurate on the deep stuff where Garcia was more accurate on the short and intermediate stuff and really made decisions very quickly. So that that was something that stood out in that 2021 year was that you could see Garcia didn't appear to be a guy who was going to have that many growing pains because, you know, these days in college football, sometimes a quarterback is is ready you know, as a true freshman to go out there and play. Sometimes it takes a couple of years of seasoning, and Garcia was showing some signs he was going to be potentially a guy who blossomed very quickly. Now, on to 2022 then. Obviously not – his 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 statistics just on paper weren't great in 2022. I'm just curious how much of that do you think was on him versus maybe just the downfall of the Canes offense last year? Yeah, it, it was it was a little bit of both. I think there's disappointment on on both sides of it. Uh, on the one hand, very few quarterbacks could have found any success in that mess last year. It was Miami's offense was a mess all around uh, from the offensive coordinator last year, who's no longer at Miami. Josh Gaddis, the play calling was just not creative, uninspired, not intuitive whatsoever. Didn't really know how to kind of get his quarterbacks going, just wouldn't really call plays to help guys get into a rhythm. Uh, and then the other part of it was uh, it was Murphy's Law on Miami's offensive line last year. They were a thin group to begin with, and they got decimated by injury. And, you know, Garcia's got some athleticism, but, you know, he's, he's not a running quarterback who can really protect himself when you've got rushers just basically going through uh, a free lane. Like, right. that, that's not really – like, he's not the type of quarterback. So, um, one of the issues and, – and part of it's on Jake, and I'm going to get to that. But one of the issues that Miami had last year when Van Dyke got hurt and then Garcia got his opportunities to play wasn't playing well. It, it was also – 
he was at risk of getting injured because there were the, the pass rush was just swallowing him up. And I think that's one of the reasons why Miami actually then turned to the true freshman third stringer, Jakari Brown, who is very mobile uh, and a great runner. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that Mario Cristobal said about Jakari was like, I think this guy can protect himself a little bit more than our other quarterbacks can in this sort of a situation. So the, the situation was not good for Garcia to begin with. Some of it was definitely on him, John, there's no question, because, you know, the first the first time that he entered into a game last year, um, mop up duty, Tyler Van Dyke actually got benched in a game against Middle Tennessee, which Miami shockingly lost. Right. Uh, and the offense was completely out of sync. They were way behind in the game. And Garcia actually added a spark and it looked like he was leading a comeback. And then in the following weeks, I don't know if he just maybe felt too much of that pressure uh, was really starting to force things, but his accuracy just disappeared. Hmm. And again, I think part of this goes back to the play calling, just not being intuitive and not giving really him a chance to to get into a rhythm. But um, the play calling got so conservative because they didn't trust his accuracy last year that he, he was really kind of throwing everything to the line of scrimmage. And then when he did uncork it deep, the balls just weren't coming anywhere close. Um, you know, he did, you could see at moments like, Gar Garcia, he's a competitor. You know, Miami had a, a quadruple overtime win over Virginia on the road last year. Garcia started and played that entire game. Um, both teams' offense was hard to come by. Garcia ended up winning the game, uh, scoring a uh, – because that was at the point in overtime where you're doing two-point conversions only, and he scored a two-point conversion with his legs to give Miami the win. Like, that was just sheer will. <laughs> On, on his part was so that a scramble play or was that it was, designed it was, it, it, was, it was a scramble play because okay. he he actually he had a tight end that looked open in the end zone and he just thought i trust my legs right now more than i trust my arm so i think he lost a lot of his confidence last year well that's really interesting and in that you say that he made such a key play with his legs because well i i assumed basically what you described to me that within the pocket at least he's fairly immobile I think I may have even used the the dreaded statue term at one point on my podcast I don't know if that's fair or not though I don't know I haven't seen him nearly as much as you have I guess what I'm curious about is maybe the 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 in the pocket mobility isn't there is there any mobility whatsoever just in terms of hey maybe we're running a, an outside zone read can he at least keep the backside of the defense honest if he if he pulls it and decides to keep yeah, I think he can. Um, he, he's he's a little he's a little quicker than he looks. Um, so I, I I think he is capable of that. Um, it's it, you know and and he he's got like a different kind of mobility from what Miami had with Van Dyke, who is kind of a statue. But Van Dyke is so big, if he gets outside the pocket, he's just hard to tackle. Whereas Garcia, he moves a little bit quicker. So, you know, don't expect too many, you know, too many first down runs, but he can do he can do some things when when the pocket breaks down, he can pick up some yards for you. He's got a little bit more of that mobility than you think. Do you have any kind of feel for what type of, of guy or person Jake Garcia is? I love him as a person. Um, you know, I remember. Last year, last August, uh, media day preseason, when we hit, got access to basically every player on the roster, uh, Garcia was one of those, just as a human being, who made one of the strongest impressions on me heading into the 2022 season. You know, I mentioned 2021, he suffered a season-ending injury, which, you know, may have cost him at least an opportunity to be the starting quarterback that year. And he talked a lot about how difficult that was for him mentally, how that was a big thing to overcome. And I think maybe physically the injury, he's fully recovered from it now. Uh, it's not a factor anymore, but that may have been maybe an even harder thing to overcome physically than he expected. And so that added a, a lot of mental difficulty, but just a really, really positive guy. And um, I'm, I'm hoping, and it sounds like in, you know, one of the chats we had off the air that he's getting, a good opportunity to try and, and win the starting job in Mizzou because he, he deserves that. I think he at least deserves that opportunity. And I know that that's something he was looking for. And, you know, I know Garcia, he loved, he loved it in Miami because um, he probably could have hit the portal a little bit earlier in that uh, winter window than he did. He kind of waited towards the very end because That's true, he, yeah. we, we got the indication when the portal first opened in December, the indication was like, Oh, Garcia is definitely a guy who could go. 
Uh, but then first couple of weeks of that, no, he's he wants to stay. He likes Miami. He wants to, you know, try to compete as best he can. But then I think he ultimately made the right choice in hitting the portal because I think with with Van Dyke was just too far along kind of as the incumbent starter for him to really get a fair shake in Miami. So I, I'm sure he's motivated by the change of scenery and he's he's going to do whatever he can to make the most of the situation. Yeah, definitely. And I, he's going to get every opportunity and all indications are in the spring. He basically split first team reps with Sam Horn, another fairly ballyhooed former high school prospect from the state of Georgia. So it's going to be interesting because Horn obviously – almost zero experience through two passes, I believe, last season, maybe only one of which counted. I think one came back on a penalty or something like that. So what to make of him is really complete faith at this point. So, Alex, just thanks so much for your time and for all the great information. Final question, and I am going to put you on the spot here. Gut feeling, do you think Jake Garcia is Missouri's starter come this fall? Well, I think the experience is going to give him an edge when you talk about that. So if, if I'm going to go with my gut, I, I'm, I'm just going to say it. I, I think he's going to be the starter. And I, I think if, as, as long as he's in a better situation than he was in Miami last year, uh, I, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. All right. That's Alex Dono. Follow him at Locked on Canes. If you happen to be a University of Miami fan or no one, definitely follow his podcast, YouTube, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, of course. That'll do it for this edition of Locked on Mizzou. Thanks for joining me as always. This week, hopefully, we'll get some good news on Matthew Cleveland, maybe Cameron Johnson on the offensive line in the gridiron as well. So you know what? Until next time, I'm John Miller, and thanks as always for listening to Locked on Mizzou.